Aloha. Welcome to Women in the Word Online. I'm so glad you're joining us for this study of good lessons from bad girls in the Bible. Somehow or other, our uh, Tuesday night live session of Women in the Word didn't get videotaped. So I'm just re-recording the talk. So those of you who are joining us by Zoom, don't miss out on anything. Well, as you know, tonight we're studying the very first bad girl in the world, and that was Eve. Eve had been beautifully created in the image of God. She had been created to be Adam's helpmeet and companion, but more than that, she had been created for a relationship with God. Adam and Eve, and we, their offspring, were designed for a relationship with God. It's why we were created. Uh, when we are walking closely with the Lord in a loving relationship, talking to Him, reading His Word, etc., um, it fills our heart. God fills our heart. He meets the deepest emotional needs that we have. Sin, of course, messes that up. Uh, God had warned Adam that if he sinned, it would end in death. Not only does it hurt our relationship with God, though, it hurts our relationship with everybody else. It breaks hearts, destroys relationships. Sin messes everything up. So we're studying Eve this week to learn how to avoid sinning and falling into temptation like she did. Now let's face it, if Eve hadn't sinned, one of us would have, I would have. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned many, many times. And when we do, we feel kind of sick inside, right? Um, sin creates separation between us and God and we, we sense that, we feel it. Um, so we're studying Eve tonight to learn how to avoid sinning. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. So beware, in other words, watch out. Take this seriously because the enemy is out to destroy you. He wants to mess up your relationship with God and keep you from fulfilling the purpose for which you were created. So don't let that happen. Be on the alert. Eve wasn't on the alert. She wasn't on her guard and she was deceived and fell into sin. And then Adam fell right along with her. One of Adam's first jobs was naming the animals. God had made Adam his regent or steward, you know, over the entire created realm and had given him tremendous liberty and authority. So whatever names Adam gave the animals stuck. There was only one restriction to Adam's domain, which is spelled out in Genesis 2, 13 through, 15 through 17. It says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, you're free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Not a whole lot of rules, right? There were thousands of trees to explore, all kinds of fruit to sample. But there was just this one restriction just don't eat from that one tree. And God even told him why, because it will lead to your death. God loved Adam. He never wanted him to experience spiritual or moral or social, relational or physical death. So he warned him against, you know, eating from that one tree and Adam heard and he understood God's warning. Genesis 2.20 says that Adam was naming all the animals, but he was looking for a creature like himself to be his companion, but he didn't find a helper comparable to him, another human being like himself. So God performed the very first operation. He put Adam into a deep sleep, removed one of his ribs, and formed this lovely companion for Adam using Adam's own flesh and blood. God might have started all over again, you know, with dust and clay to shape the woman, uh, but by using a part of Adam himself, Adam would fully identify with this partner God was making for him. Martin Luther wrote this. He said, God might have taken a bone from a toe 
and thus signified that Adam was to rule over her, or he might have taken a bone from his head to indicate her rule over Adam, but by taking a bone from his side, God implied equality and mutual respect. When Adam saw Eve, he was excited and delighted, and he exclaimed, at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Here was someone just like Adam, yet different in exciting ways. He had met his perfect match and God married them there in the garden. And so in their sinless state, Genesis 2.25 says that although Adam and Eve were naked, they were not ashamed. There was no self-consciousness, no hiding parts of themselves from each other. There was absolutely um, nothing to hinder them from complete openness and sharing and trust and oneness with each other. So their marriage and even their physical union must have just been the best imaginable. I mean, everything was so great. Until one day Eve went somewhere she should not have gone and got into a conversation with someone she sh never should have been chatting with. Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 give us some background information about Satan, who's also called Lucifer. Some people think Satan is God's evil counterpart, but that is not correct. God is outside of creation. He is above all in a category all his own. He has no counterpart. Satan is just a fallen angel. He's a created being like the other angels who had, he had a high position in heaven prior to sinning, maybe something like Michael. Um, but his basic sin was that of pride and unchecked personal ambition. He desired to be equal with or above God. So Lucifer was cast out of heaven uh, and one third of the angels who had followed him in his rebellion were, were cast out too. And ever since, Satan has had no way to strike back at God directly. So his strategy from the time of Adam and Eve on has been to break God's heart by causing people to sin and damage their relationships with God. And, you know, he wants to hurt people. He wants to mess up their lives. And in that way, hurt the ones God loves. So St Satan started working on the very first woman, Eve, drawing her toward that tree that had the forbidden fruit. And um, there he was waiting for her in the form of a serpent. Genesis 3, 6 um, seems to make it appear that Adam was right there with her. We have to wonder why Adam and Eve were hanging around that particular tree. I mean, the Garden of Eden was huge and there were hundreds or thousands of trees with luscious fruit to enjoy. But like a mouse sniffing out a mouse trap, there they were near the one tree out of the whole garden from which they had been forbidden to eat. So here's the first good lesson that we can learn from Eve. To avoid being tempted, stay away from places and people where temptation is likely to occur. Just don't go there. If you are a recovering alcoholic, don't hang out in bars or liquor stores. If you are overweight or diabetic, stay away from ice cream parlors and you know the candy aisle at the grocery store. Adam and Eve were in the wrong place by the only tree in that big garden with forbidden fruit. And here's Eve's second mistake. Eve got into a dialogue with the devil. Don't do that. Don't go to seances or fortune tellers. Don't play with tarot cards or Ouija boards. Don't seek out new age gurus or check out cults or satanic conventions or atheist websites. So many movies and shows now have occultic themes. Don't watch those. Your curiosity could get you into all kinds of trouble. Eve didn't realize who she was dealing with, but we do. The Bible makes it super clear who Satan is. He's called the father of lies. He's called the accuser of the brethren. Some of the other descriptive names for him in scripture are our adversary, the destroyer, the beast, the enemy, the evil one, the lawless one, a murderer, the ruler of darkness, the son of perdition, the tempter, the thief, 
the wicked one, etc., etc., etc. The Bible clearly warns us away from him. So let's not get into conversation with him or let our minds dwell on anything he says. In our homework this week, one of the questions was to compare the way Eve handled temptation with the way Jesus handled it. Jesus didn't go where he shouldn't have gone. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. But when Satan came to him to tempt him, Jesus didn't start talking story with him, did he? Jesus spent no time at all dwelling on those temptations that Satan was hurling at him. He immediately rebuffed each temptation by quoting the word of God to, God to him. If something contradicts the Bible, we should immediately be on our guard. Don't start entertaining the devil's ideas like Eve did. Be on your guard so you aren't deceived. Knowing God's word and obeying it is your best safeguard against being spiritually deceived. So I wanna commend you for being in a Bible study and keep having your daily devotions. If you know the word of God, that's gonna really help you avoid being deceived like Eve was. So let's go through Genesis chapter three and analyze the way the devil worked on Eve so we don't fall for the same tactics. Genesis 3, 1 says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Notice, Satan began his attack on Eve by asking her, has God really said that? This is where it always begins, you know, with questioning the validity of God's word. Whether it's some university professor or some atheist out there on the internet or some new age guru, their argument always seems to start with saying, well, we don't really know exactly what God said or we don't know what was meant by that scripture verse. God says what he means and he means what he says. That doesn't mean we'll always understand it all. We'll keep growing in our understanding of God's word for our entire lives. But Jesus said we should come to him like little children and just read his word simply like a child and take it at face value. Don't let Satan hiss in your ear, you're too young to understand the Bible or you're too new of a Christian to understand what God's really saying. Or you don't understand Greek and Hebrew. How can you be sure that interpretation is correct? Or you haven't been in Bible study long enough, etc. You are God's daughter and he loves you and he'll help you understand the Bible as you start reading it. So just read it simply like a child and take it at face value. Pastor Wayne says, if you come across a verse or a passage you don't understand, pray and ask the Lord to show you what it means. You might not immediately get the understanding, but just keep on reading the word and trusting him. And at some point in the future, He'll give you the understanding. So there were Adam and Eve hanging out where there shouldn't have been. And there was the devil. And he said to Eve, hey, do you really know what God said? Has he really said you're not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, verse two, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God said you must not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Here we go. She's getting into conversation with the devil, not a wise thing to do. But now Eve adds to the problem by misquoting what God said and adding to what God said. God didn't say you can't touch it. God just said, don't eat from it. It's a shame that Adam didn't pull Eve away at that time and said, hey, let's go. And he didn't even correct Eve's misquote. Uh, maybe Eve thought by adding to the wor word and saying, you know, don't touch it, that she was putting some sort of hedge of protection around herself and Adam. You know, if we don't touch it, we won't eat from it. If Eve had said, well, I'm thinking we shouldn't even touch it, that would have been fine. But she misquoted the Lord. She said, God said, don't touch it. And that's exactly how legalism begins and how religion starts. The word religion means to bind up. The Pharisees were the ultimate religionists and they had all kinds of rules and regulations that in their minds superseded the scriptures. 
but legalism will ultimately lead to bondage and, and bondage will lead to bitterness and to backsliding. What happens when we add to God's word and develop these extra rules, even if we're thinking they're for our own protection or our children's protection or whatever, it'll, it happened to us what happened to the Pharisees. They couldn't keep their own rules and others couldn't either. And then that led to backsliding and bitterness. The rules became bondage, so the people rebelled and gave up. So here's another thing we learned from Eve. Don't add to God's word. Stay away from legalism, from adding extra rules to the Bible. So Eve said, well, God said, don't touch it or eat it or you'll die. And Satan replied in verse 4, you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan lies outright. Now Satan's not only questioning the word of God, he's questioning the ways of God. He's saying, God's holding something back from you, something that would be really good for you. And that's still what Satan does today. Um, those are the kind of lies the devil whispers into our mind that play right into um, the wrong image of God that a lot of people already have somehow from the culture or their parents or religion or whatever, they've gotten the idea that God is some mean old ogre up in heaven, watching every move they make and ready to clobber them, you know, if they make a mistake or do anything fun. A lot of young people think God's holding back fun things from them, something that might be a blast like sex or drugs or whatever. When the forbidden fruit is tempting our children, or tempting new believers whom we're mentoring, or tempting us, what should we do? The answer is always the same. I heard a pastor on the internet say this, and I thought it was so good. He said, look to another tree to get perspective. Look to the cross, the tree on Mount Calvary. There you will see what sin does. It kills. Look at Jesus paying the price for our sins. When that crown of thorns was pressed into his scalp and his body was beaten beyond recognition and nails were driven through his hands and feet. This is what sin ultimately does. It kills. Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death. Jesus who knew no sin took all our sins upon himself and it killed him. So before you bite into that forbidden fruit, take a good look at what sin did to Jesus. It'll take a terrible toll on you too, and eventually it will kill you. Also, while pointing them to Jesus hanging on the cross, paying for their sins, remind them that it was love, pure love that caused Jesus to sacrifice himself for us. He loves us so much. He is love personified. So if he says, stay away from wild partying, stay away from that coarse joking, Stay away from sexual sin. Stay away from idolatry. It's because he loves you so much. He wants to spare you needless suffering. Verses six and seven say, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, according to Satan, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.14 says, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. In other words, Adam knew what he was doing. That's why his sin is considered worse. He knew that Eve had been deceived. He knew the devil had been lying to him, to her. But he didn't step in and stop that conversation or stop her from eating the fruit. Instead, he just went along with her. Adam saw through the devil's deception, but he loved his wife and he didn't want to be separated from Eve. Eve had fallen and he didn't know exactly what that meant, but he didn't want to be separated from her. So he chose to fall with her instead of keeping an unbroken relationship with God. He picked unity with his wife over unity with his heavenly father. <clears throat> a lot of people are still making that same mistake today. They think, oh, our love is so passionate. You know, our feelings are so strong for each other. 
will just fall together. But sadly, what happens is that the consequences of sin are far worse than anything we ever anticipated. Uh, their choice to follow their feelings instead of following what God said causes far more pain and problems than they could have imagined. Adam should have tried his, to stop his wife from eating the forbidden fruit, but he didn't. And after she fell into sin, he should have said, Lord, my wife has fallen into sin. What should I do? Show me, teach me. And the Lord would have helped him, but he didn't even do that. Um, if your boyfriend or husband sins, don't follow him. Ask the Lord for help. The Holy Spirit will help you and show you what to do. Eve was deceived. Um, Adam knew what he was doing when he chose to sin with Eve, and their eyes were opened, but not in enlightenment. Their eyes were opened in embarrassment and shame. They suddenly realized they were naked. Previously, they'd been naked and celebrated their unity, but now they were naked and ashamed. And um, that shame and embarrassment, no doubt, affected their relationship with each other as well as their relationship with God. So what did they do? As we read in verse seven, they took some fig leaves and sewed them together to cover their nakedness. I'm guessing those fig leaves had to have been awfully uncomfortable. They were probably scratchy and itchy. So their cover-up done in their own strength was not a good solution. Verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? Here's another thing we learn not to do from Eve. Don't hide from God when you've sinned. Despite your shame, turn to him and confess your sin. Confess what you've done and repent. He loves you and he will forgive you. Pastor Wayne has often said that sin isn't our worst problem. Our worst problem is unconfessed sin, um, sin that we haven't repented of. So Adam and Eve used to walk and talk with God every day in unbroken fellowship. Now they're hiding from God. And this is our tendency when we've sinned too, because we're embarrassed and we're ashamed. Sin causes us to hide from the voice of God and the word of God. And you know our desire for God's word diminishes. There's an old saying, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. If you haven't been having your devotions for a while, if you aren't hungry for the word of God anymore, please pray about it. Maybe there's some sin that you haven't confessed and dealt with and that's why you don't feel like opening your Bible anymore. So Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves and now they heard the voice of God. Um, calling them, but they hid. Uh, it says, so the Lord God called to them and said, where are you? Now, obviously, God already knew exactly where they were. God is omniscient. He knows everything. So his calling them, you know, where are you, wasn't the shout of an arresting cop tracking down a criminal. It was more like the sigh of a heartbroken father. Kids, where are you? God was pursuing Adam and Eve because he loved them, just like he pursues us because he loves us. He comes to us with the same simple question, where are you? It's a call for us to be honest with ourselves and think about where we are and what we've done. Do you like that scratchy fig leaf covering that you made for yourself, trying to justify yourself? Do you like hiding from the Lord? Are you enjoying this? Is this really where you wanna be? Verse 10 says, he, Adam, answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Again, the Lord wasn't asking this because he needed more information. He knows everything. But what he was doing was prompting them to confess. He wanted them to confess what they'd done. Why? The purpose of confession isn't for God's sake. Confession is for your sake. Confession is acknowledging that you've sinned. Without honestly assessing what you've done and acknowledging that you've messed up, you can't begin the process of being set free 
from the bondage that sin has you in. That's why the 12-step programs, for example, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, tell people, stand up and introduce yourself. And they say, I'm so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. No one gets out of bondage to alcohol without admitting to themselves that they have a problem. And it's the same with any type of sin. So confess, confession isn't for God's sake. He already knows all about what you've done and he still loves you. Confession Admitting that you've sinned is for your sake. It's the first step toward getting out of bondage. So God was trying to get Adam and Eve to confess what they'd done because that would be their first step back toward him. Um, confession is a powerful tool that starts the process of setting us free. And the wonderful news is what 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God's calling Adam and Eve, where are you? Tell me what's going on, confess what you've done. And then in verse 12, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. It's kind of like double blame, right? It's Eve's fault and it's your fault, God, you know, for giving her to me in the first place. If I didn't have her, this would never have happened. <laughs> You know, whenever we blame another person, we are ultimately blaming God too because God allowed that person to be part of our life. But blaming someone else or blaming God doesn't solve the problem. It merely distracts us from thinking about our own sin and dealing with our part of the problem. It postpones our healing and our restoration. Adam's best response would have been taking responsibility for his choice. He should have said, God, I blew it and I'm sorry. Perhaps Eve would have followed her husband's lead and confessed her sin too. But God's patience here is just classic. He doesn't rage at Adam. He doesn't give him a big lecture. He just says to the woman in verse 13, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So Eve cast blame too on the serpent, but now she realizes that she had been deceived. So now God curses the devil and that serpent who was the devil's tool. Verse 14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. When the millennium takes place, and Jesus reigns on earth for a thousand years. Isaiah 65, 25 says, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. So apparently the other animals will be restored, you know, to their friendly state like they were before the fall, but the snake will still be eating dust. Whatever noble bearing that serpent may have had before the fall and before being cursed by God, that nobility now is gone for good. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The friendship even the serpent seemed to enjoy earlier in the chapter is finished. From then on, Eve would fear and hate snakes and I'm with her, <laughs> I think most women are. Um, but, that's, but there's a much more important point to this verse. When God tells the serpent, I will put enmity between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first reference in the Bible to God's wonderful plan of salvation. Um, for that reason, Genesis 3.15 is called the Proto-Evangelium. In other words, the first gospel. We're only three chapters into the Old Testament and already God's giving us a hint of his wonderful plan to redeem mankind. The seed of the woman is kind of odd phraseology since seed usually refers to sperm and women don't have sperm. But here the seed of the woman refers to Mary's offspring, Jesus, who would be born supernaturally without any male sperm involved. Jesus is the seed of the woman born of a virgin whose heel would be bruised by the serpent, but who would crush the serpent's head. You shall bruise his heel refers to how Satan would hurt Jesus. In taking on humanity, Jesus brought himself into Satan's domain where Satan could strike him, and indeed, he did. Jesus was betrayed and mocked and flogged. His 
body completely disfigured more than any other person. A crown of thorns was pressed on his scalp. Nails were driven through his hands and feet. It was horrible. Satan thought he was defeating Jesus when Jesus died on the cross. But then Jesus arose from the grave on the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave, and proving beyond any shadow of doubt that he was indeed God. Jesus' death and resurrection were a fatal blow to Satan. Oh sure, the devil's still thrashing around like crazy in the world today in whatever remaining time he has, but just know he's in his death throes. His ultimate defeat is absolutely certain, and his destiny is hell, where he will suffer in intense agony day and night forever and ever. Sin is Satan's big toehold in a person's life. It's what gives Satan the authority and the power to mess up our lives. That's why we have to avoid it. <laughs> but when we confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness, he forgives us and cleanses us and Satan loses some of his power over us. If there are any of you who are watching this online who are still in sin, in bondage to Satan, you can change that right now. Help and freedom are just a prayer away. Please don't put off making things right with God. All you have to do is come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you. Come into my life. Change me. Help me. Save me. And he will. Um, when you pray like that, God hears you. He's always loved you. He's always wanted a relationship with you. You were created like Adam and Eve for a relationship with God. So start that now. Don't put it off. So God cursed the serpent. And then in verse 16, he told Eve what the consequences for her sin would be. He said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. This isn't how God originally intended childbearing to be, but from then on, it was going to be really painful and women would suffer. And he continued, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. In other words, you're still going to have a desire for your husband, even though pregnancy and childbirth will be so difficult. But also from now on, your husband's going to rule over you. Uh, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were equal partners, but that changed when sin entered. The New Testament says that a husband is to be the head of the house and wives are to submit to their husbands. Submission is hard. You know, if you agree with your husband's decision, then it's easy to go along with him. But if you don't agree, it's hard. Nevertheless, it's what we get to do as Christian women as a result of Eve's sin. It's part of the curse. We, we, can't, we can talk things out with our spouses. We can certainly try to influence our husband's decisions. And we can pray that the Lord will change their minds. And sometimes he does. But God says, after all that, the husband gets the last word. It's part of the curse. Verse 17 now focuses on Adam's consequences. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit of the tree of which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So this is for Adam, for the man, for men. God is saying, I need to keep you really, really busy because idle time is the devil's workshop, like they say. A man is to work by the sweat of his brow day after day after day. And it's not healthy for a man to have, you know, tons of free time. If a man isn't working, he'll find himself vulnerable to temptation, depression. He won't feel fulfilled. He'll be feeling disoriented, confused, etc. So God says, your curse is now. You have to work hard all your life. So now there's a problem. God says, woman, your desire will be for your husband. You're going to be yearning for him. Um, man, you're going to have to be working hard to make a living, working day after day, year after year. So, you know, the wife says, oh, honey, I just want to be with you. Can we just go for a walk, talk for a little while, just enjoy being together? 
and the man will say, oh, sorry, honey, I gotta get going. I have work to do. You know, the husband's thinking that the best thing he can do for his wife and kids is to provide well for them. So he's gotta get to work. Um, that's how he shows his love. But the wife's thinking, he doesn't love me. He doesn't wanna hang out with me. Marriages face a big dilemma and it's been going on since Adam and Eve fell. The reality is that men and women are very different and God has given us these different roles. And despite the thousands of relationship books that are out there on the market, we still have this big dilemma. It's the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. So here's what I take from this. Don't look to your spouse for everything. Look to Jesus. Realize that your spouse isn't capable of being your all in all. After all, he's just human. But there is one who loves you more than you can imagine and wants to walk with you and talk with you and be there with you continuously. I'm talking about the Lord. We each get to be as close to God as we want to be. He's never too busy for us. He never turns us away. In fact, you are as close to God as you want to be. So here's my advice. Take the pressure off your spouse by realizing he will never completely fulfill you. Only Jesus can. So lower your expectations of your spouse and spend more time with Jesus. No man can ever meet the deepest needs of a woman's heart. So be grateful to your husband for whatever needs he does meet. You know, he provides for you financially, he's affectionate with you or whatever. Be grateful for what he does do. Love him, be faithful to him, but realize he's not your life. Jesus Christ is your life. Lowering our expectations of our spouses makes it easier for us to just enjoy being with each other whenever we are together without trying to change each other and without being disappointed. Only Jesus can meet the deepest longings of a person's heart. People are just imperfect humans. True and lasting fulfillment is only found in close relationship with God. That's what we were created for. If both spouses are seeking the Lord and genuinely trying to live in his presence, then that quest brings them closer to God too. Someone kind of illustrated it like this. You know, if the husband is moving closer and closer toward God and so is the wife, well, it's bringing them closer together too, right? So the answer to life's dilemmas caused by the curse is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Seek God first and he'll help you. He'll help all these other things fall into place. And by the way, may I say to those of you who wish you had married somebody else, no one else out there could meet all your emotional needs either. Men are not our answer. Sure, they can meet some of our needs, but only God can really fill us up. So seek him, pour out your longings to him, spend time with him, let him fill you. And if you need more conversation and fellowship than your husband has time to give you, seek out some girlfriends. Ask God to bring you some Christian lady friends who love the Lord and will encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Because if you haven't learned that Jesus, not men, are the answer, you will bring the same unmet longings into your next relationship and be just as unfulfilled as you are right now. Jesus is the answer and heaven will be the grand resolution to the cursed situation of humanity. Meanwhile, we can have a taste of heaven here if we seek first the kingdom of God and not put so much pressure on our spouses or on other people to fulfill us. Verse 20 says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Notice, Adam changes her name now. At first he called her woman because he said she was taken out of man. But now he changes her name to Eve, which means living or life giver. Because from Eve would come all the living in the world, including the Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who would crush the serpent's head. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. God had to kill an animal, possibly a lamb, to cover their nakedness. This shedding of blood of an innocent animal 
to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness after they've sinned was of course a foreshadow of what Jesus Christ would do for us. He, the spotless lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Um, once we receive him as our savior and Lord, scripture says we are robed in his righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, our nakedness, our shame, our embarrassment, they're all covered. As Psalm 32, one says, blessed or happy is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So will we see Adam and Eve in heaven? I think we will because they allowed God to cover them. And here's a good thing we can learn from Eve. Respond to God when he calls you and allow him to cover you in his righteousness. Verse 22 says, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat it. Then he'll live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God drove them out of the garden. It wasn't because he was mean. It was an act of grace and mercy. Had they stayed in the garden, at some point they would have eaten that tree of life and you know live forever, continuing to decay and suffer the consequences of their sins forever and ever. So God's saying to us through Eve's story, don't hang out where you know you'll be tempted. Don't get into conversation with the devil. And if and when you sin, don't hide from the Lord. Run to him, talk to him, confess your sin, and let him robe you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God loves you, and he's done everything necessary for you to have a close, wonderful, lifelong relationship with him. That's what we were created for. Let's close in prayer. Thank you so much, dear Lord, for loving us and pursuing us. And um, just like you did, Eve, help us to draw near to you even after we've sinned and not hide from you so we can be forgiven and our relationship with you can be restored. I pray you'll help us seek you first and seek your kingdom and your righteousness for our fulfillment instead of putting so much pressure on other people to fulfill us. You are our maker. You are the one who knows us best and loves us most. So bless my sisters. Keep reminding all of us that you're the one that we need above all. Thank you so much that you're always there for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope you have a great week.